And uh, our session will close with case presentation. It will be again, Dr. Deno. Andre, floor is yours. Hello, this is André Deneau. I'm uh, back. Let's complete this uh, session with uh, some case studies. My disclosures are uh, shown uh, here, and I'm supported by the Montreal Heart Institute Foundation. 61-year-old woman, liver transplant, and uh, she's five days postoperatively. And uh, we're called at the bedside because she's hemodynamically unstable and also hypoxic. So that's her chest X-ray. And on the chest X-ray, you see some um, uh, pulmonary edema, some atelectasis. However, we do not understand why she's unstable. And um, because of her uh, obesity, uh, we um, do not have a good answer using surface ultrasound, which is always the first uh, uh, step in examining those patients. So we perform a transesophageal echocardiography. And uh, what we see in this patient is um, very hyperdynamic heart with left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. And you can see that the uh, mitral regurgitation in this patient could contribute to uh, the pulmonary edema. In fact, when you look at the right lung, you can see there is some atelectasis on the right side. And you can also see these B lines, which are present on the left side, corresponding to the pulmonary edema. The real question is, why is this patient suddenly changing, developing this complication, which was absent the day before? And this is when you perform transgastric abdominal ultrasound. So one of the complications that can happen after liver transplantation is at the level of the inferior vena cava anastomosis. So we go right away at the anastomosis and surprise, we see this um, obstruction, this high velocity signal uh, at the level of uh, the anastomosis of the inferior vena cava. When, uh, and then as you put Doppler, uh, you see there's a, a continuous abnormal signal as I mentioned in the first presentation, if you have normally a positive signal and it becomes continuous, that's abnormal. And this is an abnormal hepatic venous Doppler signal. We, uh, we then, you know, took back our trans thoracic probe and tried to analyze a bit in more detail uh, this uh, process. And then you can see there was both a thrombus and there was also a stenosis just at the entrance of the hepatic vein using surface ultrasound. So the patient was brought in the angio uh, suite, and uh, this is the stenosis just before and the stenosis after, and um, using uh, fluoroscopy. And then uh, the, uh, there is a uh, positive signal back into uh, the uh, hepatic vein. And then you can see also there's no more turbulence in the inferior vena cava. So this case is a nice illustration of uh, why when you have an hyperdynamic heart or a left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, you should just not say, okay, we'll just slow down the heart rate, give fluid, but try to figure out why is this happening? And in this case, that was a secondary to the inferior vena cava stenosis, which was reducing uh, the uh, cardiac uh, filling. And the solution here was not to give more fluid, but was to uh, resolve the uh, problem of the inferior vena cava stenosis. So the second case is a 74-year-old woman post-op day four after aortic and mitral valve uh, replacement. Uh, this was a um, patient who had already biventricular dysfunction uh, to some extent before, but mostly after the operation. She had chronic renal failure. She was also having a vascular disease. And uh, in the operating room was documented that, that she had a severe atheromatous uh, and grade five atheromatous disease. And um, on the fourth day after she came in the ICU, she was very unstable at two in the morning with very high uh, lactate. So this is the uh, T exam that I, um, I, uh, I uh, extract from the database. 
and you can see there was some left ventricular dysfunction and also some right ventricular dysfunction in this transgastric uh, view uh, after a cardiopulmonary uh, bypass. And also in the operating room, they documented there was some plaque. We see part of this over here. There's a small plaque in the aorta. So uh, at two in the morning, we um, came back, uh, put a T-Pro because there was no good acoustic windows in our patient. And then you could confirm that there was significant left ventricular dysfunction on this transgastric view. Four chamber view was difficult to obtain. Uh, but you can appreciate there was no tricuspid annular motion and most likely also right ventricular dysfunction in this patient. Uh, the aorta doesn't project well, but there was almost spontaneous contrast. And you can see this was a Doppler velocity into the aorta, which was uh, minimal. So basically, we were uh, having someone in a very low cardiac output state. And in fact, the uh, personnel noted that exactly at two in the morning, suddenly she had a, a major reduction in, his, uh, in her uh, brain uh, saturation, which correlated with uh, her uh, hemodynamic deterioration. So the question is, what was happening? Why was she suddenly deteriorating at that time? And uh, so when it happens, we look at the EKG, there was no change, there was no a change in pulse oximetry and blood gases. There was no change also in the process uh, EEG. Um, so um, we examined uh, the heart. We, um, we saw the ventricular dysfunction, but there was no good explanation. So we moved down to perform transgastric abdominal ultrasound. The IVC was dilated, but as we got closer to the IVC, we start to see some air bubble in the hepatic vein and also uh, there was some uh, suggestion there could be some air also in the portal vein. But when you look closely to the liver, now what you see is all these uh, white areas all over the liver, which uh, suggests air into uh, the portal uh, vessel. And in fact, this patient was developing uh, mesenteric ischemia, which was explaining why her lactate were uh, were very uh, elevated and uh, the autopsy uh, confirmed uh, the uh, diagnosis. In fact, what she developed was what we call an acute cardiointestinal syndrome with myocardial depression. So the, uh, this is some uh, uh, paper we reported uh, this patient just to explain the uh, situation. And uh, this was done by Stéphanie Jarry, who's one of my uh, PhD uh, students. Uh, basically, this concept of cardiointestinal syndrome was described uh, by uh, Sundaram in circulation in 2016. So the pathophysiology of the cardiointestinal syndrome is the following. Heart failure will be associated with uh, gut edema, but also gut hypoperfusion. The hypoperfusion is related to not only a reduction in arterial pressure, but an increase in venous pressure, therefore the pressure gradient for the gut will be reduced. The consequence will be increased gut permeability and mesenteric ischemia. However, before you get to this point, what will happen is that you'll have a bacterial or LPS translocation, activation of your monocytes and macrophage, and release of the cytokines. Cytokines will create the vasoplegia that we observe in septic shock, but also will depress cardiac function as we saw in our patient, both right and left. And also what we uh, have uh, observed also in those patients is that you'll have also uh, encephalopathy and brain dysfunction. And this is an example of a patient who's dying from right heart failure. Uh, this is the bowel and you can again see the bowel edema in this patient just prior uh, to, um, uh, to his death, unfortunately. So the gut edema is clearly related to venous congestion and RV dysfunction. And that could explain why those conditions have a, a poor uh, prognosis. So this is something we've been interested now for more than 10 years. And William Beaubien-Souligny 
uh, started his PhD at the Montreal Heart Institute and started doing research on this aspect. And just to give you an example, we've noticed again this congestion which is not only affecting the portal but also the renal circulation and this is just an example of a patient who arrived in the icu who had significant portal positivity and uh, when uh, we remove uh, fluid in this patient in this case we remove six liters over about uh, uh, six to seven days and you can see the uh, significant reduction in creatinine that we observe in this patient. The Techno Research Program was a result of uh, some of the observations we made in the intensive care unit and the operating room. Uh, so far, more than uh, 1,200 patients have been uh, recruited in this uh, project. And the most uh, important uh, one that we've done is a multicenter international uh, study in which we look at portal positivity before and after bypass. And as was, as was mentioned uh, by Dr. Lalancet, what we observe is that um, if you have portal positivity before bypass um, well and you resolve it after bypass then your risk of major complication is the same as if you didn't have it before bypass however if you develop portal positivity after bypass and you didn't have it before then your risk of major complication is almost double goes up to 40 percent and the way we think about portal positivity is a bit like one of my colleague Georges Desjardins mentioned. It, it really indicates that, that there's a fluid overload. And if there's a fluid overload, clearly uh, to give more fluid is really not the solution and will not really uh, improve your patient uh, condition. Uh, this was uh, illustrated in a study we published uh, this year in uh, PLOS One by Loé Cantar where we've shown that if you look at the um, uh, probability of a prolonged pharmacological support after cardiac surgery and the intraoperative fluid balance, you notice that the best fluid balance is almost zero fluid balance. But as you get more fluid or if you remove too much fluid, then your probability will increase. And this was relatively independent of the Euroscore 2. So in conclusion, if you insert a T probe for hypoxia or hemodynamic instability, always consider to perform TILUS or TIGAS if there's no clear answer just by looking at the heart. And finally, venous congestion is highly prognostic in cardiac surgery and probably in other uh, medical conditions that we encounter in the intensive care unit and should be identified as soon as possible before inappropriate fluid resuscitation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Andre, for this uh, great cases. Um, I think uh, it will lead us to start discussion. We have um, one question from uh, participants, a uh, couple of questions from panelists. And while I was listening to your lectures, I noted 10 of questions from myself. Uh, perhaps I should start with question from, from the floor. Uh, how often do you see um, poor perfusion of splanchnic organs in patients who are having intraortic balloon pumping? And how do you quickly evaluate splanchnic vessels? Yeah, so, uh, so that's something um, that we've been aware uh, since we um, saw this publication in, in circulation. And, and what we've seen in the intensive care unit is uh, are some patients in whom they have an intraortic balloon pump, which was inserted sometime because they have a left main disease and they arrive in the ICU and uh, the lactates start to rise. And then, uh, and then now people are, are very well aware of this condition. So you remove the intraortic balloon pump and the lactate just normalize. So, um, so we're not able always to be, uh, to quantify, you know, uh, the, uh, the severity of the, um, celiac trunk or superior mesenteric artery uh, uh, signals. But I would say, um, because this is not that common, 
But I would say if when you, you have someone with an intraartic balloon pump in the operating room, first make sure that your tip is not too far away from the subclavian artery. And, and we all know how to do this. But then I would encourage you just move down and find the celiac trunk. And you'll see many, many times you'll see the intraartic balloon pump just close to the celiac trunk. And then if you have a good signal on the celiac trunk and you see that your diastolic increase and you see your velocity, uh, that means that probably there's no compromise. But maybe in some patients, uh, the signals might not be uh, that clear. And I, I would say just to be careful, just to be careful, keep in mind that that can be, uh, that can be an issue. In the paper I mentioned in circulation, one of the conclusion was that the rule of using the length of the intraartic balloon pump, you know, depending on the size of the patient to, uh, to determine how far you should go, uh, it doesn't work, doesn't work, doesn't always work. And um, so I think uh, it's important to individualize the position. And if there is any uh, increase in lactate, I think you have to be very suspicious that that could be a compromise of your celiac, your mesenteric, or even as we saw, uh, one third of the time, uh, the renal artery can also be compromised. So I think it's important. And if you have, you can have good Doppler signals and the clean, signals are clean and you can see the diastolic, maybe that could say, well, maybe you could, you could still wait. Um, but I would say, I would just be uh, very careful in this uh, condition. Dr. Lalancet, as a cardiologist, uh, what, what, do you, what, would you, what do you think about this? Uh, I, uh, I agree with you, Dr. Dono, and uh, uh, there's mainly three sizes of uh, uh, Arctic balloon pump for the main uh, company. And uh, often for the, the small, smaller patients, uh, they, they don't always use the smallest one first. So that's a big risk to cover the, the celiac trunk and the visceral arteries. And even we had a case recently, at the, I think you were there at the Car uh, Montreal Art Institute and like the ECMO went well and all the sign of hypoperfusion uh, went down except lactates. And uh, we did a TEE uh, at the bedside. And even if we pull up the balloon just next to the... Uh, Left sub, uh, the left subclavian artery, it was still covering the uh, celiac trunk. So it's not a, a rule of thumb that if you use the, the good IIBP, it will, uh, it will be the good side for the patient. So I think the, it's always to have a good suspicion, especially if the lactates are high or if you have a small patient, then if all, like you, uh, if you have a pulmonary artery catheter or all the perfusion sign uh, goes better, but the lactate, the lactate still goes up, I think uh, it's, a, it, it's a good thing to verify. Perfect. We have we have follow-up question regarding this topic uh, from Dr. Catalin Efrimescu. Do you believe that TGAS should be a part of rescue TE then? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Especially, and that's really what we, we think, especially if you have an unstable patient who has a normal heart, okay? Or hyperdynamic heart or outflow track obstruction. That means the problem is not cardiac, it's extra cardiac, okay? So, so definitively, uh, and we've seen cases in which patient was stable from a hemothorax. So you just go 90 degree and you turn to the left and the right and you have your diagnosis. So if you have an unstable patient, make sure it's not coming from the chest. And in the chest, what you can diagnose as immediate complications are hemothorax, but also in some cases, you'll, you'll see pneumonias and you can see bronchograms as described with the uh, lung ultrasound. And then if it's normal in the chest, then move to the abdomen. And as we saw, there's some situations where you can diagnose, uh, you know, blood in the, in, the, in the stomach. You can see fluid in the abdomen. So these are critical conditions. But also you have to remember that one of the most um, insidious complication is uh, when you have resistance to venous return. And this you can see in uh, any situation like Dr. Lanasset was mentioning where the IVC uh, can be compromised. Uh, we saw this in liver transplant and heart transplantation. Um, and then what will happen is that you'll see an unstable patient with an empty heart with a big IVC. And that should really raise suspicion that there's something in between that is obstructing the venous normal venous return. Because the treatment of this is not medical, it's surgical. You have to do an intervention and it's very important to identify this, uh, this condition. So for sure, uh, it should be part eventually of rescue TEE. And, and, and in fact, when you have TEE, you know, uh, 
there's no reason why you shouldn't look at the IVC uh, as we do with transthoracic echo uh, in those patients. Dr. Lalancet, any uh, comments? Uh, I, I agree with you, Dr. Dono. And uh, in the critical care, we, uh, critical care, we do the same thing, like take a look at the art and after on surface echography, take a look at the lungs, take a look at the abdomen. I think if you have a TE probe in for an unstable patient and you don't have good view or in a, you are in a perioperative setting, you are, you already have the, uh, the probe in. So why not take a look at everything, especially when the art is normal? We have, we have, uh, yeah, thank you. So thank you for your answers. We have next question from Annette. Uh, looking at so many vascular structures, venous structures, uh, when you do TIGAS, uh, and is it, are, are flows affected by uh, heart rate disturbances, AFib, pacing, etc.? Yeah. So for sure, uh, pacing does affect the hepatic vein. Okay, so, um, and, and we did some studies. Initially, when we start looking at the hepatic vein, we saw, well, that's a great uh, way to assess RV diastolic function. And the first study we did, we found that, um, in fact, uh, if you have a, a normal hepatic venous flow, that was associated with difficult suppression from bypass. But from that study, what we found uh, was that the pulmonary hypertension was more prognostic than the hepatic venous Doppler signal. And then subsequently, we did other studies where we find, in fact, that the right ventricle was more, uh, right ventricular dysfunction was more predictive than the pulmonary hypertension because, as you know, if you develop RV dysfunction, your PA pressure will go down. So, uh, so if you just use the absolute value, that won't work. So RV dysfunction. But what we found over the years is that despite the fact that you have arrhythmia, spacing, uh, the positivity of the right atrium should not be transmitted to the liver uh, through the portal vein. So if ever you end up in a situation where you have portal positivity, that really means that the right atrial pressure is significantly elevated. And definitively in an acute context, this is this is this will this can lead basically to a cardiointestinal syndrome. So you have to be very careful of this. And this will be relatively independent of the pacing because the pacing can be done, can have pacing on, um, on a patient with uh, normal or elevated uh, right atrial pressure. But so far I haven't seen any patient in which we remove the pacing and the, and the portal positivity normalized. So uh, we have not seen this. You maybe the only situation which could happen is that if this patient has a better cardiac output when they have their own sinus rhythm, uh, then maybe that could improve your, uh, your flow. Uh, but if, but definitely, uh, portal positivity, if it's present, uh, that's uh, that's a very bad sign. It means that the filling pressure are very elevated, and it's transmitted beyond, you know, the uh, hepatic capillaries. So that's that's a bad sign, and that's what we were able to show in the multicenter uh, trial. So, just more. Any any comments on this? Um, no, uh, I agree with you, and I think the other thing is, is with like. Uh chronic severe RV failure. So uh, those those signs might be present even if the patient is stable. So that's the uh, that's why I think you need to uh, add to uh, to uh, interrogate the Doppler before and after and to see if there's any change. And just to keep in mind that some patient even at baseline may be deeply anormal in the critical care in the operative setting. So uh, especially uh, chronic severe RV failure or chronic severe TR. Yep. And I think that's a very, very important point you mentioned, Jasmine, because we had the, one of our colleagues was a cardiologist who studied a uh, patient with heart failure and, uh, and portal positivity is extremely uh, common, you know, in compensated and even decompensated uh, a patient. So, so what, and that's why it's so important to obtain a baseline, because if it's abnormal before, then you might expect it might stay like this after. But if it was normal before, as we show, then and it becomes abnormal. This is this is significant. So really, the change in portal positivity is very important, and that has I think that's more prognostic. They're just looking at portal positivity and said, oh, I'm gonna try to remove this this abnormal portal signs. I always tell you don't treat ultrasound. You treat a patient. Okay, you don't treat an ultrasound sign. You treat a patient, and you have to integrate all the information you have: the hemodynamic, the cardiac output, the portal positivity. And then you take, try to take the best decision for your patient. So from, from what you are saying, 
uh, is it uh, safe to assume that cardiointestinal syndrome is more common with RV dysfunction than LV dysfunction, or you see it in both entities? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. Often LV dysfunction, from my experience, you know, when you just have LV dysfunction, but your RV is preserved, often these patients will do well, you know, after cardiac surgery. And that's, that's probably the experience of everyone. You know, if you have a bad LV, but the RV is fine. But as the, when the, you have a poor LV and then the RV start to fail, or if you have pure LV, uh, this is really when we get complications. And there's many studies showing, you know, the prognostic value of, uh, of RV dysfunction. Dr. Lana, so Asma, what do you think about RV and LV uh, issues? Yeah, I, I, will, I will say the same. I'm another heart failure specialist, but what I've seen in my training and in heart failure clinics that patient with bad LV but preserved RV, no uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension are doing pretty well. And the patient that with the same LV function develop RV failure, pulmonary hypertension, that's the one that will do on well, will develop mostly... Uh, cardiac cirrhosis, uh, more uh, acute kidney injury, and that's the one that will worry about them and they will refer to advanced therapy uh, sooner than uh, later. We have another question from the floor. If you see air in portal vein and liver, do you uh, directly proceed to OR for laparotomy or laparoscopy, or you will still confirm your findings with uh, CT? Um, I think if we... Uh... I, th I think if we see air in the portal vein, uh, we would typically you know, go for a CT scan, you know, to confirm this because there are some false uh, positive. Like for instance, uh, uh, we've seen air in the portal vein in patient with um, uh, with uh, duodenal, duodenal uh, tubes. Okay, and and the, the mechanism is is not there, but it's possible that uh, you know with uh, the feeding or the pressure, some air might get in the portal vein. So these patients will, uh, will might have air in, in the portal vein. Doesn't mean that they have a cardiointestinal syndrome. Uh, but definitively, uh, what's happening, what we see in the ICU is that when uh, you have high lactate, uh, people will look at the portal. And if there's air, the, 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 the suspicion uh, might be so hard that maybe they won't even go to the CT scan. They're going to go in the, in the operating room for laparotomy because that's very suspicious, especially when you have high lactate. So the combination of high lactate, uh, portal air, that's very, uh, I would say, very uh, suggestive of uh, mesenteric ischemia. If you just have portal air, normal lactate, uh, probably it's not the same significance. So again, putting all the elements together, and, and again, I would repeat this, never treat an ultrasound image, mm -hmm. treat a patient, and put all the things together and then take the decision. Perfect. Um... Uh, we still have 15 minutes. Uh, I still encourage uh, our participants to to write questions in Q&A. I will take liberty to ask a couple of questions from my list. Uh, I must say, um, when I follow your lecture, uh, read your chapters, and when I try to get all these uh, vascular structures which you describe from a transgastric view, it's not always that easy. What are the tricks? Uh, in education, how how do you make it easy? And the second question is, um, when you start teaching your fellows who are predominantly coming to learn cardiac ultrasound in first place, are you introducing uh, concept of TIGAS from the beginning or this is second stage of, of, of their education? Well, I, I will let Dr. Lanarset, who is a fellow, answer this question, tell him how we proceed, how we taught him, you know, how to do this, just know. Yeah, so uh, I I was uh, already uh, performing a cardiac TE, but I've never done T gas or anything before. And uh, what uh, are we working on in uh, at, in Montreal with uh, Dr. Dono is to start with simulation. I think what can help a lot at the beginning is to view with the simulator and the 3D views where the structures are and what when you're moving the probe down, left, right, left with the uh, and the degrees to see exactly where are the structure, where are the vessels. And uh, so you, you can place them uh, around in a, in a 3D vision. And when you, you have uh, like maybe a, a day of training with that, and after you go to the operating room, I, did have, I didn't have any uh, permission with that. And with Dr. Dono, uh, rapidly I was able to do the basic like Doppler uh, vein, uh, do uh, sorry, uh, hepatic vein, 
a portal vein, a splenic vein, celiac trunk. It's not that hard when you practice a bit with the simulator at the beginning. And uh, I think it's to have to have a, to have seen some of the standard views. Sometimes it's it's harder for like the celiac trunk and mesenteric arteries. There, like if uh, the anatomy is not uh, perfect, it, it may it might be a bit far. But for the hepatic, it's uh, the hepatic views. Uh, it's always giving a, a good uh, acoustic window. So for the uh, sorry the hepatic vein and the portal vein, it's pretty easy, especially when if you uh, did a bit of simulation before with the uh, 3D visualization. So uh, it's not that hard. And uh, after just practice and you you will have some case that uh, will be harder because of the acoustic window, but most of the time it's easy to uh, obtain a good Doppler of the hepatic vein, the artery, uh, arterial, uh, the uh, hepatic arteries display uh, the uh, splenic vein and uh, the celiac crown. So, so basically, uh, Marcin, we're using simulation. So the simulators allow us uh, to um, to do uh, to simulate all the, the abdominal vessels, abdominal anatomy. That's how that's how I, I showed you some of the videos. And really, what's really help us a lot is we're using uh, holographic ultrasound. You know, we, we have HoloLens, and we can see it in three dimension. So you can hold the, the, the liver in your hand. And you can turn it around. You can see where the portal vein is. So that really, as Jacimo was mentioning, gives you really a 3D perspective of the anatomy, and it's much more. It really helps. And and when we teach TEE, uh, you know, the morning is cardiac, the afternoon is extra cardiac. That's how we do it. So so for every fellows, uh, for the critical care training fellows, and also for the anesthesia resident, the R3. So the morning we teach them cardiac TEE, and the afternoon we teach them extra cardiac TEE. So that's part of our standard training now. And when they are in the OR, the anesthesia resident, they spend three months with us. So the first month is just doing TE, and the second, the two other months is doing cardiac anesthesia. So basically, they have three months of uh, whole uh, training. So um, so before they come in the OR, they have a day of training in the transesophageal echo. And um, now with the new simulation center was recently uh, officially, uh, it's going to be officially uh, recognized this week, uh, but it's been open for almost a year. So what we're trying to do is to have the fellow to be able to perform the T exam on the simulator before they go in the OR. Okay, so then they they are they are much more faster, and they can also learn to do the measurements and to do the, these things. So that's something we try to incorporate into our practice, and and that really helps. But the simulation is the key is the key because if once you see it in three dimension, uh, and when you see how it moves, it really helps to understand where. Uh, to do it. Uh, the, the last generation of simulator also has 3D echocardiography, so we're even able to um, to get the biplane views, uh, which would really help for this, uh, the, the anatomy of the abdomen also, and the 3D NPR reconstruction also, which helps you to understand the anatomy. But you know, the heart is much more complex than looking at the liver. I can tell you that. <laughs> That's true, <laughs> but this is this is very important information, and, and there is significant body of literature showing that if you start training with simulators, then it goes much faster and much more smoothly in the operating room and critical care. Uh, another question from Annette. Uh, once you, once you uh, see a pulsatile flow in, in splenic vein or, or portal vein, how, do, how does it change your management? I guess partially you already answered. You, you try to improve RV function and look for other yeah. causes. But do, anything to add? Yeah, in fact, and that's really part of the, of the research we're doing. So um, we use a lot of NL vasodilators, and uh, and you know we we did a lot, uh, we did a, quite a few studies, and we're able to demonstrate that when you use a combination of NL, NL vasodilators, uh, and typically we would use epoprostenol and metronol, uh, the combination is much better than when you use them alone, and and there's uh, probably eighty percent of those patient are responders. And what we were able to document is that if you're a responder, you're going to do much better postoperatively than if you're a non-responder. And that, I think, uh, and John Smoke could co comment on this because it goes with the literature in pulmonary hypertension. Like if you're responding or not responding, it really will affect your, your outcome. And yeah. what we've seen in the operating room is that if you have a patient, you start with RV dysfunction, 
pulmonary hypertension, portal possibility. We really want to bring that portal pressure down, the right atrial pressure down, because the more higher it will be, the more these patients not only will develop complication, but they will bleed. They will bleed because most of your bleeding is not arterial, it's venous. Okay? So if you can bring down the venous pressure and that patient, that the surgeon operates in, in, in a field in which the venous pressure is reduced, but acceptable for adequate cardiac output, then we think that could improve, uh, could improve outcome. We need to demonstrate this in, in, in randomized trials uh, but that's been our that's been our experience uh, that 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 could help. The only problem with this is that there's some areas which you cannot control. And as William Bobby and Sunini uh, showed you, we're doing also a transcranial Doppler uh, in in our patient, and you can see in some patients you have thousands of emboli, lots of emboli. And we recently do documented that the number of emboli is directly proportional to your complication, post-op complication, because you know if you have lots of emboli, you're gonna have RV dysfunction. And if you have RV dysfunction, then things will go badly. So it's not by giving NL vasodilators that you're going to prevent aromboli. Okay, so so uh, so that's why there's also a confounder, uh, which could explain why the, the, the randomized trials that we've done just with Nerino uh, didn't work before, uh, because we're, we're not aware at that time of the importance of this, uh, this confounder and, and the outcome of our patient, because the number of emboli clearly is associated with uh, fecal suppression from bypass, as you may as you suspect. But definitively, the lower the venous pressure, the better uh, the surgeon will be in operating because the bleeding will be much less. Uh, that's our experience. Jasmo, any comment? Oh, I think it's a, it's very complete, and in a critical care, we'll will uh, will use also the portal vent flow to say maybe it's enough of volume, or maybe need diuresis <laughs> and. Uh, Inotropes. So, uh, and uh, as we said before, and uh, we'll uh, we we'll try to have a baseline and to see after intervention is it getting better or worse, and what we can do. So, uh, it will be integrated with all the other MODANA I make data, and uh, so I think that's the uh, the use of that. <laughs> Based on what you said, uh, and and it become a routine in your practice to look at pulsatility, if patient is not responding to therapy, uh, not responding to diuretics, did you notice that you are introducing renal replacement therapy earlier, or it's difficult to say at this point? Yeah, I would say in the ICU, uh, if it's not responding, uh, we would we start CVH very rapidly in those patients because, and, and you'll see, as you're gonna reduce the venous pressure, your vasoactive support will come down, okay? And, and we, we've seen this and the renal function will improve. So we will be what we'll be, be much more aggressive, but that would be based on individual patient, and it's not the strategy uh, that I would use. There's there's been recently in the Canadian Journal of Cardiology a study on uh, uh, you know hemofiltration in cardiac surgery, and uh, I don't do it on every patient. I just do it in those in which I know there's excessive fluid. So again, I would be careful not to uh, try to treat everyone the same way. Like I always tell, uh, there's no. Uh, universal dentures that doesn't this does not exist and it doesn't work. Everyone is, is different. And our role with ultrasound is to get as much information on this particular patient to say, well, if we do an intervention, we think, we hope, we hope, because it's not always possible that we're, we're not trying to make it worse. And that's really one of the things I've learned over the years is that you don't want to make your patient worse. You want it to try and maybe to try to avoid complications. So I think that's why it's so important to know what's exactly the venous condition of your uh, of your patient. Regarding the reversibility and the response to uh, Jasmine, uh, what do you, uh, what, 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 what are your strategies in cardiology or in the ICU in those patients? But uh, if the patient didn't have any uh, venous congestion with no pulsatility and he develops RV failure with and uh, you see the diuresis goes down, and you, even with the uh, maximum dose of diuretics, that will be the kind of patient that will be uh, will will uh, be aggressive on their uh, renal replacement therapy. But as you said, it's not a universal strategy. I think we have to integrate the, those data with uh, all the rest. And uh, I think uh, in cardiology, in a, like uh, patient. Uh, uh, like uh, external patient, uh, if if there's venous congestion, venous pulsatility with uh, uh, pure LV function, that's the one that will be faster on referral for uh, evaluation to advanced therapy or 
So uh, that's that's might be the patient who who will uh, will not have a good uh, uh, evolution of their disease. So uh, that's uh, mainly how we use that. Perfect. Um, I have one question regarding uh, renal resistive index. I know that William is not with us, but perhaps you can try to answer the question. You presented uh, very interesting data showing uh, importance of early post-op increase in, in uh, resistive index. What about uh, looking at this information before surgery? We know that every second patient coming to big cardiac centers has impaired kidney function, has uh, reduced GFR. Any, any data on that? Yeah, well, there's been some studies showing, you know, the renal resistance index has some prognostic value, uh, especially uh, in cardiac surgical patients. The only problem, and, and, we, and, and we mentioned this, uh, is that most of the study where they look at renal resistance index, they just look at the renal resistance index, okay? They didn't look at the splenic resistance index, the hepatic resistance index, or the cerebral resistance index, okay? And that's a problem because uh, if you just have a normal renal resistance index and the rest is normal, you have a kidney problem. But if the resistance index is reduced everywhere, that's not necessarily a renal problem. Okay, it's a systemic problem. So that's why I said one of the rule, never, never analyze a, a Doppler signal alone in isolation. You need to find another, you need to find a friend that tells you, oh, okay, that's a problem with the kidney. No, 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 that's a systemic problem. Okay, so it's very important. And most of the studies, unfortunately, on renal resistance index, often I've just looked at the, the kidney. They haven't looked at the other organs. So if the renal resistance index is high because you have aortic insufficiency, I doesn't know. I don't know. There's so many factors affecting this signal that that in isolation, I don't think it is it is as promising as we we might we might uh, we might think about. Perfect. And there was a question from panelists. You already answered it, but I believe it's very important to to all participants. Uh, you basically mentioned that the, in your study, when you did passive left, uh, leg rising and increasing cardiac output uh, in those patients who are responders, uh, renal restrictive um, resistive index went down, which was a good trajectory. So that's, that's very important information. Uh, I believe we have three more minutes. There is one more question from one of the uh, participants. Uh, and it's Dr. Quang Shim. Uh, renal outer medulla is the most vulnerable portion of to hypoxic injury, and accordingly, the proximal tubules they are cause of AKI. What do you think about grading the renal blood flow according to the region of interest? Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. The problem is that we don't always get good uh, renal uh, Doppler signal in all our patients. That was mentioned by Dr. Sweeney. But what's it's becoming interesting in that some work of Dr. Silverton is that people now are looking at the urinary PO2, okay, or what's the kidneys pulling out, you know, in terms of the analysis, the, the urine, and they, they've been correlating this with uh, the renal outcome. So, um, so, so you know, we're the I think the, the kidney needs attention, and there's some elements that we need to uh, to see, but sometimes. We don't have all the information with with the uh, with the Doppler signal, and I think there's other methods for evaluating renal function that are uh, promising. Looking at biomarkers, uh, urinary con urine content, and uh, some people have even look at the oximetry. Uh, but keep in mind, if you use uh, non-invasive oximetry, you have to know what's the distance between the skin and the kidney because if it's too too much, uh, you might not really uh, grab this this information. But um, uh, you know, if you have great uh, renal Doppler signals, like uh, we showed you in one of the secretory arrests, then you could probably explore this avenue. Unfortunately, it's not always the case uh, for all uh, all your patients. So that's that's I would say a limitation for uh, for this kind of application. Perfect. I think our time is up. Uh, thank you again for putting uh, together for excellent excellent session. I think uh, it stimulates lots of questions. Uh, it stimulates all of us to, to expand be, uh, beyond cardiac echo. Um, I'm sure you will get more questions to your emails. Uh, any housekeeping information from, from Annette or from Azad before we go for lunch or, or dinner for people who are in Europe? 
If not, no, we're uh, all good. We're all good. Okay, we have 45 minutes break uh, before we come back. Once again, thank you very much, Andre. Thank you very much, Jan Simo. And uh, pass our thanks to William. Good. Bye-bye.